Now it was time for the money changers to get back to the business of a new private central bank for America. During the early 1900s, men like J.P. Morgan led the charge. One final panic would be necessary to focus the nation's attention on the supposed need for a central bank. The rationale was that only a central bank can be prevent bank failures. Morgan was clearly the most powerful banker in America and a suspected agent for the Rothschilds. Morgan had helped finance John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Empire. He had also helped finance the monopolies of Edward Harriman in railroads, of Andrew Carnegie in steel, and of others in numerous industries. But on top of that, J.P. Morgan's father, Junius Morgan, had been America's financial agent to the British. After his father's death, J.P. Morgan took on a British partner, Edward Grenfell, a longtime director of the Bank of England. In fact, upon Morgan's death, his estate contained only a few million dollars. The bulk of the securities most people thought he owned were, in fact, owned by others. In 1902, President Theodore Roosevelt allegedly went after Morgan and his friends by using the Sherman Antitrust Act to try to break up their industrial monopolies. Actually, Roosevelt did very little to interfere in the growing monopolization of American industry by the bankers and their surrogates. For example, Roosevelt supposedly broke up the standard oil monopoly, but it wasn't really broken at all. It was merely divided into seven corporations, all still controlled by the Rockefellers. The public was aware of this thanks to political cartoonists like Thomas Nast, who referred to the bankers as the Money Trust. By 1907, the year after Teddy Roosevelt's re-election, Morgan decided it was time to try for a central bank again. Using their combined financial muscle, Morgan and his friends were secretly able to crash the stock market. Thousands of small banks were vastly overextended. Some had reserves of less than 1% thanks to the fractional reserve principle. Within days, bank runs were commonplace across the nation. Now Morgan stepped into the public arena and offered to prop up the faltering American economy by supporting failing banks with money he manufactured out of nothing. It was an outrageous proposal, far worse than even fractional reserve banking, but Congress let him do it. Morgan manufactured $200 million worth of this completely reserveless private money and bought things with it, paid for services with it, and sent some of it to his branch banks to lend out at interest. His plan worked. Soon, the public regained confidence in money in general and quit hoarding their currency. But as a result, banking power was further consolidated into the hands of a few large banks. By 1908, the panic was over, and Morgan was hailed as a hero by the president of Princeton University, a man by the name of Woodrow Wilson. All this trouble could be averted if we appointed a committee of six or seven public-spirited men like J.P. Morgan to handle the affairs of our country. Economics textbooks would later explain that the creation of the Federal Reserve System was the direct result of the Panic of 1907, quote, With its alarming epidemic of bank failures, the country was fed up once and for all with the anarchy of unstable private banking, close quote. But Minnesota Congressman Charles A. Lindbergh, Sr., the father of the famous aviator Lucky Lindy, later explained that the Panic of 1907 was really just a scam. Those not favorable to the money trust could be squeezed out of business and the people frightened into demanding changes in the banking and currency laws which the money trust would frame. So, since the passage of the National Bank Act of 1863, the money changers had been able to create a series of booms and busts. The purpose was not only to fleece the American public of their property, but to later claim that the banking system was basically so unstable that it had to be consolidated into a central bank once again.
After the crash, Teddy Roosevelt, in response to the Panic of 1907, signed into law a bill creating something called the National Monetary Commission. The commission was to study the banking problem and make recommendations to Congress. Of course, the commission was packed with Morgan's friends and cronies. The chairman was a man named Senator Nelson Aldrich from Rhode Island. Aldrich represented the Newport, Rhode Island homes of America's richest banking families. His daughter married John D. Rockefeller, Jr., and together they had five sons. John, Nelson, who would become vice president in 1974, Lawrence, Winthrop, and David, the head of the Council on Foreign Relations and former chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank. As soon as the National Monetary Commission was set up, Senator Aldrich immediately embarked on a two-year tour of Europe, where he consulted at length with the private central bankers in England, France, and Germany. The total cost of his trip alone to the taxpayers was $300,000, an astronomical sum in those days. Shortly after his return, on the evening of November 22, 1910, some of the wealthiest and most powerful men in America boarded Senator Aldrich's private rail car and in the strictest secrecy journeyed to this place, Jekyll Island, off the coast of Georgia. With the group came Paul Warburg. Warburg had been given a $500,000 per year salary to lobby for the passage of a privately owned central bank in America by the investment firm Kuhn Loeb & Company. Warburg's partner in this firm was a man named Jacob Schiff, the grandson of the man who shared the Greenshield house with the Rothschild family in Frankfurt. Schiff, as we'll find out later, was in the process of spending $20 million to finance the overthrow of the Tsar in Russia. These three European banking families, the Rothschilds, the Warburgs, and the Schiffs, were interconnected by marriage down through the years, just as their American banking counterparts, the Morgans, Rockefellers, and Aldriches were. Secrecy was so tight that all seven primary participants were cautioned to use only first names to prevent servants from learning their identities. Years later, one participant, Frank Vanderlip, president of National City Bank of New York and a representative of the Rockefeller family, confirmed the Jekyll Island trip in a February 9, 1935 edition of the Saturday Evening Post. I was as secretive, indeed as furtive as any conspirator. Discovery we knew simply must not happen, or else all our time and effort would be wasted. If it were to be exposed that our particular group had got together and written a banking bill, that bill would have no chance whatever of passage by Congress. The participants came here to figure out how to solve their major problem, how to bring back a privately owned central bank. But there were other problems that needed to be addressed as well. First of all, the market share of the big national banks was shrinking fast. In the first 10 years of the century, the number of U.S. banks had more than doubled to over 20,000. By 1913, only 29% of all banks were national banks, and they held only 57% of all deposits. As Senator Aldrich later admitted in a magazine article, Before passage of this act, the New York bankers could only dominate the reserves of New York. Now, we are able to dominate the bank reserves of the entire country. Therefore, something had to be done to bring these new banks under their control. As John D. Rockefeller put it, quote, competition is sin, close quote. Secondly, the nation's economy was so strong that corporations were starting to finance their expansions out of profits instead of taking out huge loans from large banks. In the first 10 years of the new century, 